Dr. Colin Campbell, who's an assistant professor at Kent State. He's part of the Department of Marketing and Entrepreneurship. He previously held a tenure track position at Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and has also lectured at the University of Mannheim in Germany and Simon Fraser University in Canada. His research focuses on how the internet, social media, and mobile devices evolve our evolving marketing theory and practice. So please welcome Dr. Colin Campbell. Thank you, thank you for the warm introduction, Paul. It's great to be here. And, um, to be rounding out the semester of Kent and also rounding out your series here as well too. So before we get started, uh, I just wanted to plug one thing which we do here at Kent and one of the reasons I came to Kent actually, and that was to launch our social media marketing course. And I teach this course, I've done it now four times. I started it, I designed it, they're probably just wonderful. But, <laughs> and one thing we look for in the course is we're actually looking for clients to work with our students. So we've got students who um, work in teams and they go out to and work with the client and take over the social media marketing for about a month. And they start running just content, regular unpaid content, and then toward the end they spend about two weeks actually running Facebook ads as well too for the client. So it's a great experience for both clients, people who want to get on social media if they have another company do so yet, or the ones looking for some new ideas or some help with it, and also a great experience for the students as well too. All we ask is you cover the cost of Facebook advertising, which we suggest is $2 to $3, but we're going to run $100. That obviously depends on the client and what your goals are. That's it. So basically, you're paying for ads and you're running on Facebook and If you're interested, please uh, let me know afterwards. I've got cards up here as well, too. And we're always looking for new clients. And I know this, there might be some small business owners or people who are excited about this. Let me know. We also, of course, have graduating students who are looking for internships or jobs. So uh, I know it's a hot area. And if you're interested in that, also let me know as well. So again, thank you so much for having me on um, tonight. Uh, just my usual official uh, slide here. And then um, often I get this question of how tall I am. This is a, I love this slide. It kind of situates exactly how tall I am relative to NBA players. I'm a bit taller than LeBron at 6'10", and, but still quite short, shorter than uh, the Alpine. But this is going to be some respect. It makes more sense for me standing up talking to me. But, Onward to tonight's talk. So what I'm really excited about talking with you guys tonight is native advertising. And it's a brand new sort of form um, of native sort of advertising that's being discussed a lot over the last two years. And we're going to take a look at what that actually is, where it came from, how we think it actually is working. It's not a whole lot of research body yet, and what you might think about going forward with it. I'm not necessarily sure how well this will apply to smaller businesses, it will in some ways. But it's a really cool, interesting new phenomenon that's happening, and I think we're going to see a lot more of it going forward as we move into the future. One point as well, too, I encourage questions. Um, I know this is a really sort of interesting sort of new topic as well. If you have any questions, feel free to raise your hand and jump in. I don't want anybody to feel lost for the rest of the presentation. But with that said, let's get to the first point, which is taking a look at what native advertising is. And this is a really good question. And I started first thinking about this one back in 2013. And there was a great blog post that's on HBR's blog looking at um, arguing that we need a better definition of native advertising. And I read this with interest, and I agreed. And I started working on better trying to find this, this new advertising form. And I worked with some co-authors, and we had a paper that came out um, in March last year. And it was actually a lot messier than we anticipated. There wasn't really a good definition at that time, and there were a lot of conflicting definitions of what it actually was. And the more we sort of went into this rabbit hole, the more complex things became. And what we ended up doing in this paper initially is not really defining the advertising by itself, but trying to really take a look at the multiplicity we see of new forms of brand-related online content or advertising. But what we noticed is that there's been a huge change in the amount and type of brand-related advertising or content that we see online. And here we've got um, a table I know it's very hard to read. On the left-hand side, we've got unpaid and paid, as the dimensions of the split there. And then across the top, I've got the different sources you might get information from. So the brand itself, brand and news media, the news media, and of course, users. And again, I know this is small, I don't necessarily intend to do the um, analog the plate, but what's cool is that if you look back to um, an earlier time, what we saw is that content advertising got from brands was all paid. 
and other sources for unpaid. What we're seeing now is a huge increase in the type of stuff that we're getting related to brands. And we're seeing brands posting content that's unpaid and the other forms as well. The news media itself as well posting paid content about brands as well too. So we're seeing a blurring that's happening between the news media and advertising. Since that, in that paper, we actually defined what advertising was. As always, if you're on the early papers, you would tell us you're right. And the advertisers have actually taken a slightly different tack with what they define the advertising to be. They have a very loose term for what this is. And all the things highlighted in yellow here are to be what are often considered native ads. Yeah. So the sponsor the of In terms of sponsoring kinds by that you mean somebody paying to have a place or paying to have a ribbon or what? Is CNN sponsoring it or are they creating it? Studies, looking at eye tracking, how people view websites, and you can see here 
They ignore the uh, green blocks of those batteries. They just don't look at them. Batter blindness on screen is what it's called. And people simply don't look at Today, if you get about a 0.1% click-through rate, that's considered decent. So from 70% down to 0.1% in you know, 10, 15 years. And today, nowadays, um, all of this cartoon, the truth in advertising, you're probably ignoring this. <laughs> that really is what it comes down to when it comes to um, display advertising banner ads online. And this is a really big moment of driving for brands. Because what brands discovered is that with the internet, it wasn't about them. They weren't really invited to this party, so to speak. And there's been a lot of discussion about this, and this is, there's a great paper actually titled this, which looks like this phenomenon explicitly. And in the paper, Fournier and uh, Lee and other co-authors um, say that the web was made for people and their conversations. People wanted to speak with each other. They didn't necessarily want to see content from brands. It wasn't as rich, it wasn't as exciting as a TV commercial. And people basically just tuned it out. And brands had a really hard time being able to find their place on the internet. Here we've got another great quote. Uh, brands seem to be authentic. Their presence intrusive and out of place. They didn't want to hear from brands on the They didn't want to hear and see this um, banner ads from them as well. And a really nice quote of Walt Tim, we move from a world where the brands set the agenda to a world where consumers decide if and when brands are invited. This is a big paradigm shift for brands, going from that madman era, where right, being able to pay, to get attention, and people would see it, and they had to see it, it was on TV, to this new era where consumers could easily block it out or simply not view it. And as a result, consumers chose not to look at it. And online advertisers had a tremendously difficult time trying to connect ad revenue online because people simply didn't look at it. In fact, um, uh, the GE's global head of media strategy such a nice movie really says, traditional digital advertising has become wall. It doesn't improve anyone's experience on the site, and readers, myself included, pretty much look past it. And for most of you, you probably point to you know, a few great TV commercials you've seen in the last week or two you might love. They're like, they're they became. But when it comes to online, what are you seeing in the banner ad? It's just really high retention and exciting. Maybe a video, but probably not a banner ad itself. So this is very depressing, uh, not good for online uh, advertisers. And a lot of media sites struggled to try and get ad revenue because they simply didn't have a compelling product. There was some hope, though. And what we saw is that even as newspaper print ad revenue went down, that's our top line in orange, we saw a tremendous decrease in the amount of ad revenue in newspapers you see. People were shifting to reading content online. We didn't see that green line at the very bottom, which is newspaper digital ads, pay off. Newspapers were not able to repeat their losses from print ads online. What we did see, though, and this is the line in the blue, is Google did tremendously well. Google was able to make tons of money off of what they had just ads. The difference here is that Google's ads were vastly different from banner ads you might see on the website. What Google did is they introduced AdWords. I'm sure most of you use Google at some point, and if you Google something, you're about good year, you can go to Ohio president now. Um, if you take a look at the results, you'll see, you'll notice that at the very top, these are ads. And we'll see we've got ads at the top, we've also got ads on the right hand side. What's interesting here is that these are consistent with the way you use Google. So the ads you have at the very top here, they look the same as the search results you get from Google organically. And actually, half of all users of Google don't realize there are ads on. They blend cohesively into the experience, and people don't see the money. They fit in. And Google's make most of their revenue from AdWords, from simply paying people to pay them to have their um, content be higher on the search engine results. We also see ads on the right. Those are ones in the shopping portal, different things there. Um, the new, newer innovations, but the core of um, Google's money all comes from AdWords. And the big takeaway here is that how people use um, Google fits with how Google has AdWords. It has their ads as you set up. And people don't mind it if it runs in. The second big thing we saw is that brands began to go on social media. As consumers went to social media and began using sites like Facebook, like Twitter, we saw brands go on there as well too. 
Or is it really interesting to take a look at somebody's Twitter feed or somebody's Facebook feed, which are most of you have Facebook or Twitter or some sort? If you follow a brand, if you like the brand's page, what you'll know is the content you receive from brands looks exactly the same in terms of style and format as content you receive from friends or other organizations you might follow from you. So here we've got one that's coached at Starbucks about their new type of thing and content that we've got here. But um, it looks just like a regular Twitter post. There's nothing to stay from it, but it is still designed by some things from Starbucks. Consumers like receiving news and updates from brands in their social media. It fits with how they use the service. And what we saw is that there's tremendous growth. Brands saw huge growth in the number of people who were following them online. So you might manage uh, Facebook or Twitter accounts for your businesses or your brands, and you know, you know, millions of people who follow brands on Twitter, and even more follow them on Facebook. Consumers overwhelmingly want to connect with brands and businesses on these platforms. They like this way of getting updates from them. So what we see here is again, like in the AdWords, is this early need of advertising. We're seeing that these social media updates, they fit with how people want to consume information. They fit with the user experience you have as a consumer using one of these different products. So, marketers, of course, quick to uh, recognize any opportunity, realized people responded positively to seeing updates from brands and their social media feeds, but didn't with display ads. They were banner ads online. And of course, they quickly innovated and began offering the chance to sponsor posts and have paid things appear in Twitter feed. Here we've got, uh, this is a snapshot yesterday, I was looking for ads. Um, one at the very top, so my Twitter feed, we've got an ad for shoes. And that's how that on the big web there. There's a sponsored post from this brand that paid to have that ad appear in my Twitter feed. And again, it looks and feels just like another post you might have in your Twitter feed. Likewise on uh, Facebook, again, I was trolling through yesterday looking for examples. Here's another example, taking a look at my um, Facebook feed. You can see here, I'll highlight the orange as well too. Uh, it's an ad from Fulham looking at um, new shoes again. It's really simple for the universe to find new shoes. But again, this looks just like a regular Facebook post from a friend or from another um, brand that might actually follow. We're going to see this evolution of how many ads appear in stream and the same format as whatever you should kind of do or kind of experience at that time. Yes? So, did you want that to be on your page? Or is it just coming on your page? There's two ways it can appear. One is if you actually like that brand and follow it. Okay. The second one is if it's paid for. In this case, it's paid for. So here's the suggested post, which means that they paid to have that placed on, um, on my Facebook page. So you got paid for that? I didn't get paid. The brand paid Facebook for the privilege of putting that in my Facebook feed. But you didn't want it, actually. No. Okay. So you didn't want it to be on your page. Yeah. I probably actually went to the site later, early in the week. It's remarketed and we wrote out the cookies and use that to target with gas. But I did not get permission for that to be there. So you could have ads on your page that you have coming really want. Definitely. And you can't do anything about it. You can go in and say you don't like this particular ad, a little arrow in the top right hand corner, right. and opt out of them. But uh, most people don't do that. You can offer that particular advertiser, not just advertisers in general. Sure, sure. Yeah. Any other questions at this point? Okay. Um, I imagine it varies from company to company, but in general, do they ever put ads on for competing business? Like, say you sold cellular phones. Would, uh, what are the chances that another cellular phone company would be on your page? If you were working for that company, or if you were how how would you like? Say you had your own business and you sold, you know, you were a reseller of all major software companies. Right. Would your competition could your competition have an ad on your site? On your on your Facebook page is an individual to you, right? So um, they might realize that you work in that industry and show you as a person those ads. But they can't put ads necessarily on your on your company's Facebook page itself. That's right. That's right. So let's like, say you were say you sold shoes and this was your company website, that ad for another shoe store would not be on your site. It would not be on your it would not be on the shoe store's um, page. 
they could be on their, um, well, could have, you know, they could have the other people to target, they can target your users or your people who follow your brand. So Facebook, if people see you in the community of people who follow your shoe store, right, keep Facebook allows other advertisers to pay to target your customers. So they wouldn't see ads on your Facebook page itself, but they, your users may see that in their feed. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you have any data yet on the blindness courses about people scrolling past those? I have data. I'm going to put it in the next slide. You have a, a great sense of the future. It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so, speaking of that, here's some data. So, what, one study, there hasn't been a lot of research, that literally came out this week. This is from Sheraton and Nielsen. When they're looking at um, the percent of attention people give to native ads, ones that appear in stream, versus a banner ad. And here they're comparing a native ad to a banner ad in your stream. On a desktop computer, they found that 50, you get 52% more attention, more visual attention, this is through eye tracking, if you have it as a native post, or a post that looks like a Facebook post, or looks like a um, Twitter post, as opposed to just a banner ad. Again, showing people are ignoring these banner ads. If you move to a tablet device, if you're looking at mobile experiences, it moves to 200 percent So people just really tune out of banner ads, even if they're in stream, but instead look at these as posts. And again, the question really is what's driving this, right? Fourth thing is it looks like a regular post. You can for that added of doubt initially because it looks like a post with friends, your family, or perhaps a brand you might walk to the end too. Other research from the interactive data are present here as well. As they take a look at different forms of digital advertising, and what they found is that people actually prefer in speed, in feed sponsored content. Here on the side, starting again, super small print. We've got on the left hand side going from least appealing to most appealing. And on the bottom, this is my favorite dimension, going from most annoying to least annoying. And what we see here is the in feed advertising, this is in the top right hand corner, indicating that it's the most appealing and least annoying. People prefer this to actually having banner ads or other forms of digital ads, such as things like pop-up ads or So what we've seen the sample size That is a good question. This one for Evelyn, I believe this one's five thousand. I can look it up as any of you report if you like, but I believe this one is actually a large one, I think it's five thousand. Cool. So in terms of the evolution of data facts, what we've seen, again, starting off in the beginning, Google AdWords, when we saw, saw social media ads, again, based on that in-theme community experience. And obviously we saw marketers begin to innovate even further. When we saw, I don't know if you've seen things from BuzzFeed, some sites that began to pop up devoted to the creating content paid for by brands. Here we've got, you know, many different lists you often see on BuzzFeed of, you know, entertaining sort of like mobile sort of um, things, you've got nine easy steps on how to treat your cat, and this is brought to you by Temptation's captions. And here we've got that mentioned here, cited as the brand publisher. We also have the right hand side, Facebook information on them, and they also have the app at the very bottom of the list as well, too. So here the goal was really to create content to bring people to look at this, and then hopefully see the fact that um, Temptation's cat treats is all over it, and we'll see that as well, too. The next evolution we saw though is that online media publishers to more traditional outlets began to solve a huge increase in revenue that you could receive from units. And we saw a lot more traditional media outlets begin using the events. And a lot of people may not realize this yet, but places like the New York Times, Forbes, the Atlantic, and Huffington Post all now have entire departments devoted to media advertising. What this means is that they're creating stories that look like news articles but are actually paid for or sponsored by brands. Here's one from Fidelity, and um, here they have an article, Should You Accept Your Employer's Pension Buyout Offer? And this is brought to you by Fidelity and Fidelity Voice. And here we talk about Forbes brand voice, connecting marketers to Forbes audience. So Forbes is allowing Fidelity to pay them to create this content and have it look like a news article on their site. The Atlantic has done this as well too. Here we have one brought to you by IBM. And again, talking about big data and the role of the chief data officer. And there's another one you might have seen in the news. Um, this one is a very famous one now. The Atlantic had an article about Scientology. 
And it was a very positive article about Scientology. And this is one that caused a huge uproar and a lot of response from viewers who didn't expect to be in line to be having these kind of posts and to really have such this kind of topic on their site. And this is really, it's, it's interesting because they've been doing this for quite some time. And this is what caught people's attention. And there's a huge uproar around this. And um, they actually retracted the article and they had to revise the guidelines. There's a whole bunch of um, to do about this. And the real question that comes out of this is, why do people care so much about this, but not the other? So the big question here is, why such a strong reaction to the be allowed to say that? Why do people not care about BuzzFeed? Why do they not care so much with Facebook or with Twitter? Or even less so with Google and their ads as well? First big reason I think was this. Go ahead. Uh, if it's a paid advertising, it's got to be mentioned on the page, right? You would think so. And the way they mention this is that small little yellow box yeah. where it says sponsor content. I would agree with that, and the world would agree with you as well. Yeah. Uh, question is, uh, I, didn't, I wasn't tracking the review. Was the Atlantic purchase this content from Scientologists, or was, how, who is the purchaser of the information? So, in this case, Scientology paid the Atlantic to create this article about it. There's two different types. You'll often see either sponsored content or what's also the group content content. Typically sponsored content, not always, but typically it means it's created by the news organization. So Scientology would pay them and they would have the free range to create content about that. In other cases, you'll see situations branded content where the brand itself is paying and actually has the right to create the content themselves to post it. The big issue I think that we're really hit on with the Atlantic is this idea of the breakdown of the separation between what they call church and state. And that is that we expect that editorial content and advertising content be separate in a news organization. And what we're seeing online is that they're blurring this. We're seeing these two different pieces of content blurring and connecting. And it's becoming very difficult for you as a viewer, as a consumer, to recognize what is actual news and what is paid for advertising. And advertisers will argue that they're creating stories that are exciting, and they want to produce stories that people want to do stories. And it's led to this, um, uh, this great cartoon I love. Here we've got Daddy, instead of a story, can you read some branded content? <laughs> and if it's really that good, and people really want to read their kids, probably not. It's also led to discussions, ironically, um, from Forbes, given uh, how they do this. Are the desperate publishers selling their souls with native advertisers? Are they so desperate for money that they're selling their editorial integrity to the highest bidder? The evidence would argue yes. Um, this is a, a study from Content League, which ironically is an Native advertising publisher. And they ask the question Do you think a new site loses credibility if one's article is sponsored by a brand? And the overwhelming majority said yes. The big issue is people don't necessarily realize it, they don't always see that it's there. Another interesting one um, is. Uh, study as well too, this is again the early one looked at from IMD. Here we've got three different types of content or considering different sites. We've got business sites, entertainment sites, and news sites. And here they're trying to argue that this is a good thing. The data advertising helps. But what we'll see here is the lowest bar is the benefit that the site gets from having that data back. And news sites are the lowest ones. So people don't want to see this when it comes to news. And again, this is, so this is uh, looking at the increased favorability of websites as a result of community uh, content. This is another one, sponsored content perceptions. And this is the belief that it adds value to your site experience. And only 27% of people feel that that's the case for their new site. So this first one really is, again, breaking this expectation that you're going to have a separation between what is news content and what is advertising content. But I think it really goes beyond that, though. I think that people are okay with that under some circumstances. We've seen this before with advertorials. You've probably seen advertorials in magazines where you can uh, newspapers of insert some time for those exceptions, things like that. People are generally okay with it if they know it's there. And this is what I think really drives us this idea of disclosure. The people aren't fully really aware of this happening online. They don't expect it, and then what we're seeing is that these disclosures are not strong enough. People want to see well, who's responsible for the content. And they also want to be aware, 
there's an advertising game to it. So I think if those things are actually apparent, people are more okay with this. And again, we go back to all the way back to you know the very early days of advertising. You see here this is Guinness's guide to oysters. And of course, you want to drink Guinness with an oyster, but markers dry. You have to admire that. But what's interesting is that there are rules for how advertorials operate in integrity. That much is established. When it comes to online, though, what we really see is even more things the wild west. And the rules literally are being written now. They're not clear as of yet what the actual proper disclosures are. And it's still being debated. And for this reason, I love this, um, this graph looking at, do you trust sponsored content? No, I don't, we don't trust it. That's the lowest part. So people don't even know trust it. But again, the thing is just they don't always know it's there because it comes down to these disclosures. There's a great um, video as well, too, if you want to see more on this, um, from John Oliver. It's a great show. If you Google John Oliver and you advertising on YouTube, it's a great time in segment looking at this very issue. And it really brought to light the fact that this is happening. Um, and this happened about I believe, six months ago or so when we aired this. The FTC, of course, is concerned about this. And they had, back in December um, 2013, they had a special session, a whole day workshop conference on this. And they tried to really understand what data advertising is and what the property disclosures are. The big issue that they're running into is that in social media, on your phone, on your tablet, it's very difficult to have a property disclosure with a very small screen size. With Twitter, 140 characters, how do you have enough disclosure there? Right? What should the right size be? If there's so many different variations of the sub content out there, it's difficult for them to have proper descriptions. But it was a very intense workshop, and um, not a whole lot came out of it, and it hasn't really been settled yet. I've actually spoken to them, they're interested in what we're working on, and um, they're still trying to work this out, but they're still perplexed by what exactly the proper disorders are. And consumers overwhelmingly don't seem to notice or care to it. So I guess in that sense, they're not necessarily driven to you know, solve this quite yet. The Interactive Advertising Bureau, they have what they believe should be the proper disclosures, and they argue that it should be really clear what is paid for advertising and what isn't, and that it should be water and visible enough for consumers to notice. The issue is that they have no power to enforce this. They are a body composed of advertisers, and they obviously have the best interest in having lost advertising happen. And overwhelmingly, what we see with the evidence is that people do not feel this way. They do not feel that the disclosures are big enough or salient enough. Here we have a question. Have you ever called received upon a few months of an article or video sponsored by a brand? 57% said yes. So this points to the current disclosures not being quite strong enough. The other big issue is that there's so many different terms that we saw at the beginning. Sponsored content, branded content, native advertising, um, brand voice, all these different things. Most people are confused as to what it actually is. So 48% of people asked what sponsored content means actually get it right. Most people don't know what it actually refers to or who the actual source is. So there's a lot of ambiguity for what the actual terms are as well too. What I think this really comes back to is first and foremost having the proper disclosures. And if you look at sort of the spectrum of different ways you can disclose and the different hierarchy you might have with disclosure, at the very base level you have a missing or ineffective disclosure. I think this is what we saw we much earlier at the Atlantic, for example. So here, this tiny little yeah, yellow square at the top left wasn't enough to truly signal to people this was an ad. This was an advertorial as opposed to an actual editorial article. Yes? Can I ask you a little bit? Mm -hmm. um, I'm talking about articulate here. The news is the news. BuzzFeed's fine. Facebook's fine. You know, you expect to have this kind of stuff in those two. You turn to the news for news, for facts. I'm still, I saw that sponsored content, but I'm still extremely concerned, even if that's the, you know, the blinking, that the Atlantic would do that. It is surprising. So to me, it's not disclosure, it's the news is pairs and entertainment and business, according to your charter or app. Right. It's they don't understand their role. I agree. I mean, they want the money. It's like that that article. They're desperate for money, so they're selling their soul. They're, it's the news. It's the New York Times. I, I it's not us. Yeah. So, yeah, no, it's, it's, it's 
very different. That's, that's yeah. true. Yeah. Uh, just to be the devil's advocate, you could argue that it's over-regulated, because like, for instance, say, self, say I wanted to sell you something. I could send you a thousand flyers in your old-fashioned mailbox, and that would be perfectly legal. I could send you a thousand flyers every single day, and you would simply grid them out, and that's legal. But if I were to send out an email blast to help you learn, or say you send me an email blast saying, um, I'm offering free tutoring on how to create your social media for your company, and you sent that to me once a year, if you don't dot all your I's and cross all your, um, you know, by putting your name, address, and asking me if I want to opt out, then you might get hit with a huge fine from the federal government. Or say this was, you know, five years or a few years ago, and you sent out uh, a fax blast saying, you know, I'm offering all this stuff, you know, the first eight hours are complimentary. If you didn't get permission to send that fax in the first place, you could get a huge fine and have to go out of business. I mean, why are they, you know, imposing all these fines for technology, but yet the old-fashioned advertising, there isn't any fines? It's a really good question. I think that the big issue is the cost is so low now that you go online. That if you don't know, send a million emails, it's probably going to cost the same as sending out hundred flyers. Right? So it becomes so easy to work out some sort of regulation in the community with, with emails and you know, other sort of digital things like that. These, of course, you, know, you have to go to the site to see them. But it is a good point. I mean, we probably will see more regulation in this area going forward. Yeah. So you've been in other countries. Is there any other countries It's out in the everywhere else in the world, too. Yeah. I mean, do they mind? I haven't seen research on it outside of the U.S. yet. So the U.S. right now is leading with it. But um, I would expect that the European places like that would have stronger laws on this. But uh, I have not heard about that yet. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
incentive for advertisers to not want to have hugely salient disclosures because people are less likely to click on the ads themselves. And then the strongest level, I believe, is to actually have consumers opt in. This is what we see with social media. If you subscribe to a brand, if you follow a brand on Facebook, or you follow them on Twitter, and they have too much stuff being posted or not interesting, you can always opt in. And you have that option to do so much like email as well. And again, Starbucks does this, or any sort of you know brand or organization they follow on Facebook, you can easily opt in. So here's an example from Top Gear, from the Angel Program. Um, you can if you don't want to hear your same from them, you can simply opt out and not receive those messages from them. So I think that there is a clear hierarchy of what people expect from the disclosure. And the higher you can move up this, this hierarchy, the better. You can give people the permission, sorry, the, the uh, ability to opt in and out, that's better. You can give them explicit disclosures, or at least implied disclosures, is better than having nothing at all. This has been so far somewhat negative for native advertising, and um, I want to ask the question so, is all native advertising bad? I don't think that's the case. I think that in some cases, well received, sorry, I'm well done, native advertising can actually be really well received. And the big question then becomes what makes a native advertising, a sort of native ad, good? I think that the, the beginning intention of what a native ad is meant to do is really to fit into how you use the internet, how you're using a site what it is you're trying to achieve. If you think back to Google AdWords, you were trying to search for something to solve a problem. And good ads actually help you achieve that. In many cases, the AdWords um, you see at the top are actually huge development and can be very helpful. You search for Nordstrom, you probably see Nordstrom at the top, it's probably a paid ad. And you put on that and they're happy because it solves the problem of trying to get to Nordstrom. Right? Likewise with social media. People want to follow brands and updates on things they care about. Right? And that was a great thing to do it, which is helpful, and with less intrusive than receiving emails that we go to the website, follow, and a few things there. So the things, good data ads fit how people want this information, and fit how people are trying to solve problems. So I think in that sense, going back to that IAB definition, they're really on point with that. Right? The data ads are less intrusive, they're not as annoying as you might have bad ads or other types of visual ads. And I love this kind of version as well too, if you're like a hot dog suit, shouldn't native advertising feel a little less conventional? I think that really is the point. You don't you want to be sort of gently persuaded and not necessarily you know, have a fact it's an ad. You want to be aware it's an ad, but you don't want to necessarily have to necessarily annoy. You want to be relevant and helpful. The second, I think, really important point of good native advertising is that disclosure is really important, not deception. I just goes back to this idea of having an appropriate level of disclosure, the higher the better, and not trying to trick consumers into clicking on things or reading things that aren't actually what people believe they are. I don't think that's a good strategy for brands going forward. The other one is to offer value. So people go on to the Facebook feed or the Twitter account or whatever it is you online to try and have fun or enjoy something and solve a problem, and they want to see things that are relevant to whatever experience they're trying to have at that moment. There's another great person I love. If, uh, I have new baby things to share. It's one post they see. Another one I just got back from my reunion, so friends and family. Then we have sponsored post. Did you know that we have seven subs over six grams of fat from Subway? And here it says, if you're going to crash our reason, you at least make it interesting. And I think this really gets to the heart of what good native advertising is. People don't mind advertising if it actually has value. And that value can be either information you might receive more entertainment. People love seeing English things online as well. We've got a couple of examples here of good native ads, ones that um, have been well received. This is one that actually ran on the New York Times, and this is from HBO and Netflix, and it's for Orange is the New Black, the TV show. There was an article, a really blog article, looking at women in prison and how it's different, how women made that male inmates. And it received claim, it was a well researched article, people liked it and people really enjoy it. And he complained about this one being a sponsored post for the story that was created at the behest of those two advertisers. The other one, Netflix did a great article on Wired. Wired magazine has a whole very unique online article looking at TV and how it's evolved over the years. And again, with all research, they hired a really good um, well-known psychologist, marketer, Jennifer McCracken, to write the article, and people really like this. It is a pushy, it is necessarily about Netflix, it's something that you want to read and it fits what you expect from the writer. A little bit more fun examples. Anyone here who used or heard of Tinder? It's an online dating app um, for your phone. You just go to Facebook, 
Another one, Archer. And we're here on you've seen Archer, it's an animated TV show. Fake James Bond, but it's animated, very fun, sort of edgy cartoon. What they did is they were trying to reach the audience, specifically younger um, adults. They went on Reddit, which is a huge internet discussion board. You can talk about anything and everything there. And the show was quite edgy. So what they actually did is they went into some form of Google Post um, salacious photos, and they created ones of the characters in the show and posted there, it goes there, and it's it. Obviously, this excited the audience. It was very funny and humorous. And we can go for talking about the ad campaign itself because it was so out of this you know, expectation of what you can see with a, a brand. Another new site is Walt's in, um, The Onion. I don't know if you've seen that one. It's a, it's a terrible new site. And Southwest wanted to do a really neat campaign looking at um, making fun of their customers, um, which their customers love them. And so they partnered with The Onion and had them create a video which actually pokes fun at how much Southwest is going to see and how much they do for the customers. I can actually show you this um, video now. It's going to get place. Three more sound. That's the amount of sound. In any case, it's a, it's a humorous um, one that after that video, taking a look at how Southwest has done so much for you that now they expect you to do something for that. So it's basically just back to the onion, it's satirical, it's ironic, it's edgy, and this is what we're seeing as well as it. So I think going back to what we earlier saw the definition of being advertising, so it's summed up as you know, ads that don't look like ads. And we've seen, we've seen that done kind of again for the impact. A lot of take advantage of that and consumers in the process. I think what we're really looking at with data ads is that they're ads that we're aware of, but we don't mind. We want to know that they're ads, we want them to fit in and be useful, but we do want to be aware that they are being paid for. So, a couple of um, conclusions I have here. One is that I think that all else equal, I think that it's better to have an ineffective ad than a deceptive ad. I don't think it's a good long-term strategy for brands to try and trick consumers into local things. I don't think it's going to work. I think consumers need to be very quick to find ways around that. I think that it's a very short-term approach. If you're going to lose trust in brands and lose trust in publishers, you do this and take this approach. The other weird irony um, of native advertising is that good native advertising seems to depend on trust in the brand and trust in the culture. The research so far seems to be that people only want to see it from well-trusted policy friends. The irony, of course, is that it also tends to erode. So I don't think this is a long term strategy for them to do that. But going back to the advertising marketing 101, people typically don't mind highly relevant ads. If you have a relevant, well constructed ad, people are usually okay with it. If you're moving and you see ads, moving services, or new mattress, or furniture, you don't mind that. It actually helps you solve the problem. Right? People don't mind good advertising. And there's a huge potential in data ads to be highly targeted. Because they're online, because they can be really creative, you can have a lot of really interesting ads that can be really popular to us as a consumer, and hopefully be more appealing than you might otherwise see a bad ad or typical ads you might otherwise see online. So, moving in the future, I think that we're in the very beginning stages of data advertising. We're still only a few years in. This year, we're supposed to have $4.3 billion being spent on your ads in the States. It's expected to get 8.8 .8 by 2018. And this year's model, we're also expecting um, this idea is to have the FTC to finally have clarity on what the rules are for disclosure. So they have a really nice um, guide that they post online to each one called Dot Com Disclosures. It goes into a lot of detail what you have to have the retail site and things like that online. Um, it doesn't really fully cover the yet, but they're expecting this year to come to that and come out. What we're also seeing is we're beginning to see um, innovation from consumers. One Google engineer who was very angry about this whole practice actually created a uh, plugin for Firefox and Chrome called Ad Detector. And it will label with a giant red bar that content is sponsored. So I just I think just to be some pop-up blockers, you know, people being able to pop up pop-ups and you know technology getting around this. We're going to see a similar thing happen with technology if consumers are truly angry about this. And then hopefully we'll see less of the Atlantic style articles which are deceptive and not well um, signposted, and that we'll see more fun, creative examples of data advertising that fit in with how we actually want to consume information and have experiences online. So thank you. I'm happy to take questions you might have.
and it actually, um, you know, these studies are looking at competitiveness. And you can actually tell by fake ones because they're often too positive. There's nothing wrong at all. So they'll actually go through and they'll look to see if they're too positive to the content. And you can also see the certain IP addresses are posting thousands of reviews a day in the blog page as well, too. So they're getting more adept at actually screening those out. But it is a, it is a concern.
millions of followers on Twitter or on MySpace or any of that, do you ever get um, a fraction of that advertising go to you? Uh, with Facebook, so with that YouTube, definitely. So YouTube, they have a YouTube partners program, and you will get part of the money on the ads and the placement of the videos. And the people will make full time salaries doing that. There's a lot of celebrities who do that. Um, the YouTube celebrities do that, making money. And that's their, their major thing. With Twitter, I'm not aware of that being possible. I don't believe that Twitter will pay people for having large followers on uh, Twitter. What you might get, though, is you might get free um, products and free services from people trying to get added followers. So often it's difficult to try and find influencers or very popular people online in a certain topic area and send them you know, the car site you want. You might get free access to cars, free use of cars, or review, and then they want you to write out some positive things about those cars. And one of the rules the FGC has is the action of the skill set. So now bloggers who receive any sort of compensation for writing a review or a post about a certain product or service have to say that in the post. I did, I have heard that, let's say you had your own website and you wrote reviews of different companies on your website and then you also had um, banner ads on it where you get compensated by you then you had yeah. this website. Yeah. Well, any other questions? So we go through, one of the things that we're getting is we do a social media audit. So 
you're going to look at what your um, firm, how they're doing online, and also competitors and what they're doing. Probably the easy where they are, but also get an idea of what competitors are doing. And then use that to then build a plan. So you have earned from the big content plan for how they're trying to develop all three of different areas in your business. And then execute that in a couple weeks and then get on your ads. And at the end, they use those same tools and assess how well it's actually worked or not worked.
So I mean, like after Burger King did that, didn't Facebook shut down their account temporarily? They, I'm not going to wear it off. Yeah, perhaps they did. I'm not, I'm not familiar with that, but no, they got handed out. Do you want to? Cool. Well, thank you so much for having me. Or, yeah, sure. Um, just going to the distinction between brand and the big distinction there is typically sponsored content would be the Atlantic would have the right to create a story. Whereas with branded content it would be the site um, to the publisher, the brand itself created a story. So branded content, the brand would create the story and give it to the site to the publisher. Whereas with sponsored content typically, not always typically, it means that the, the site itself has the editorial right to create it and publish it. Yeah, no if you have any other questions, we'll be around for a while. And again, if you're interested in how this might, you know, potentially work with you in the fall, I've uh, got some business growth up here. Otherwise, thank you so much for coming and have a great evening.